I mean, this is the Z-Man Games Edition, so I've clearly had this one for a while. Hey, I'm Alex Radcliffe from Board Game Co, and this is my review of Glass Road from Uwe Rosenberg from previously Z-Man Games, although the new edition is currently being published by Capstone, in case you're checking that out. I've had this game in my collection for a while, which will give you some small degree of spoilers about how I feel about it, as well as the fact that it was in my top 100 games of all time this past year, but Glass Road, let's talk about it. Glass Road from Uwe Rosenberg is one of the faster Rosenberg games, or at least faster Rosenberg, Rosenberg games in the genre of well, you know, resource conversion and all that stuff. If you want some really fast Rosenberg games, there's Patchwork and there's other smaller games, but that's kind of immaterial here. Glass Road is a game of resource optimization, of resource conversion, of playing cards, of trying to predict and outwit your opponents and trying to build the best buildings or the best combination of buildings on your personal player board in a way that does so better than the other players across four rounds of play. That's the high-level 27-second overview of what this game is. From a more detailed perspective, every single round, you're going to select five cards, and you're going to select them, not randomly off the top like I just did. Meanwhile, the other player is selecting their five cards, which for the purpose of this example, and I'm kind of teaching to you as if it's a two-player game, there are variations to the three-player experience. The other player has their cards, which for the sake of this conversation, I will have to look at, sort of, but I'll put it off to the side there. And I'm going to go ahead and select, let's see, let's go ahead and select my Charcoal Burner. So I'm going to play my Charcoal Burner over there, and I'm going to check to see, oh, they played their Charcoal Burner. And that's important because this is the way things work in Glass Road. When you play your card, you're going to pay the cost on the left side of the card. Then you're going to get the effect on the top and the bottom of the card, which in this case happen to be identical, but they are not always identical. And then... If the other player played the same card, then I'll turn, if any other player played the same card at that point, then they're going to reveal it, and then instead of getting the top and the bottom, both of you will get either the top or the bottom. In other words, you will get less because somebody else picked the same card as you. And there's more context to how that strategy plays out. We'll talk about that in a second. You're going to effectively rinse and repeat that idea across the five cards you play, although you may not have the opportunity to play all your cards. This is where the strategy part comes into play you effectively will only regularly play three of your cards. In order to get the other two of your cards played, you have to kind of piggyback on someone else's play. So when you are selecting your five cards, you are trying to select a combination of things that are good for you, that you do not think others will play, that you will then actively play on your turn and not get half the rewards, get the full rewards instead. At the same time, you're trying to pick some cards that are also good for you, that you do think others will play, that you will not actively play, rather you will passively follow someone else's action in order to get the most possible out of the round, while also hurting the efficiency of their action. If those last 30 seconds were a little bit complicated, I completely get it, let's try that one more time. In Glass Row, you're playing three cards, but you're selecting five. In order to take the benefit of the full five, you will have to follow others' actions. Whereas if others follow your actions, they are compromising on your benefit by making you take less. So your goal is to pick a selection of cards, some of which you will be able to play and anticipate that others did not pick the same cards and follow you, thus ensuring you get the full benefit of the action, while also ensuring that at least two of your cards will be cards that you can follow others, meaning that they did pick and will play, and you can be like, ha! I play the, the, what is this? I play the Feudal Lord because you play the Feudal Lord, thus ensuring that you get three full actions and two partial actions while also ensuring that they get two partial actions less well than they would have before. Again, it's a little bit complicated, but it actually makes sense once you're playing it. That's the basic premise of how the resource aspect of the game plays out. Past that, you're doing a whole bunch of things, which is a good time to go through some of these cards. I'm just going to go through some of them over here. You can pay food, and you can go ahead and build a building. That's the builder. You can build two buildings if you get it correctly. You can do the slash and burn farmer, where you remove one of these tiles from the board, both clearing up space to build more stuff, as well as getting the resources shown. You have the pond builder, which will add a pond to the board, and that's basically just clear it out, as well as getting resources for every pond you have, and you start with two ponds. You have the pit worker, same idea, but with pits. We have the cultivator, who gives you one of any resource, one of any uh, terrain type, plus uh, lets you build. We have the fuel collector, which lets you pay a water and then get coal or wood. And then we have the forest manager, feudal lord. I can keep going, but the general idea at this point should be fairly clear. I'm not going through all of them. The general idea is you're going to be maneuvering and mitigating and managing and adjusting and removing and adding to your board, trying to get as many resources as possible. As you sit there and try to build these buildings, being mindful of the costs on the left-hand side and the benefit of those buildings, 
top row is going to be resource conversion. You get this building over here, and I can always, at any point I want, turn three sand into a brick over there. That can be incredibly helpful. It helps you turn the resources you don't want or the resources you have a good engine for into resources you don't have a good engine for. That's going to be the top row of buildings over here. Then we have the next row of buildings, which is going to give you one-time benefits. You get a chunk of stuff all at once, but then it's one and done, and it's over. Although buildings do have points in the top right corner, so you still want to be mindful of that. And then finally, we have the bottom row, which is generally going to be more point focused in terms of giving you points for a variety of things give you a point for every forest tile you have on your board which could be incredible although forests really do clog up your board so you're playing a very different game if you have the forces office that is a cheap six point card at the beginning of the game and in a game where the point scoring tends to be between like 20 and 30 points six points is tremendous but it means you're operating with a handicapped board and it also means that you're more predictable than you might otherwise be because you're probably not going to be playing cards that get rid of your forest and you probably are going to be playing cards that get rid of your various or trying to get buildings that get rid of your other tiles over here. Lots of prediction around how this game plays out. And then lastly, before we get into a few other small things, we have the resource board over here, which has a clever mechanism to it, in the sense that as you move up these tracks, you adjust your resources. Some resources appear on both tracks, and when you gain that resource, you can move on either track. But as you move this up, as soon as this moves over here, this dial rotates, effectively reducing one of each of the resources over here by one, and adding one to your brick. Glass and brick are going to be your deluxe resources, and as soon as you have the opportunity to make them, you must make them, effectively reducing all your other resources by one in order to make that product. It is very clever in the way it does it, it is very clever and simple in the implementation of the system, and it gives you the resources you need, it gives you a little conversion wheel over there. Then you're going to rinse and repeat across four rounds of play, clearing the buildings in between each round, until effectively someone has one glass road. Now the two to three player game, I'm not going to heavily focus on the differences just because it's a little bit complicated to explain, but they both have the same basic idea of the card play that I talked about. The difference is that the, these cards in the wrong pile, the difference is that the, the three player game has a little bit of an extra mind game about the specific order of the sequences that you play things and that you reveal things in. I'm not going to heavily get into it, but they're, they're two variations of the same idea of trying to be mindful and predicting your opponent's cards as you pick your own cards. Now that you play Glass Road, let's talk about the actual game. So, this is a fairly easy game to explain, although in my opinion, I always teach this game uh, by, and rules are, reading the rules itself, not that hard, although honestly it's been long enough since I first read the rule book that I can't easily comment on just how accessible it was, but as far as teaching the game, I teach this on a regular basis, and this is a game that's very easy to teach if you go through a round of play. That's what I usually find happens. I tell people to randomly select five cards, put them down, and then we just go through a round of play showing how it triggers, how things play off each other, then we reset and actually play the full game. I find going through the sequence it tells people exactly what you're doing as far as how to take advantage of your cards. But once you do that, it's a fairly easy teach. Uh, gameplay comes in at roughly 30 to 45 minutes. A really slow game will come in at 60 minutes, but I find closer to 30 to 45, especially if you're playing a two-player game, which is my preferred player count for this game. At three players, it goes a little bit closer to, to, to 45 to 60, but even then, I think closer to 45. And I personally try not to play this one at four. I think I've done it. It's been a long time. It's my collection. I'm not certain, but I, I, it's been a while, and I don't think I want to do that again. As far as player count, speaking of player count, uh, we this is a two to four player. Uh, sorry, one to four player game, I believe. One to four player game. I have not played the solo mode. I have played this at two, three, and I'm pretty sure I played it out of four players. Uh, two players is my preferred player count. I find the mind game of going back and forth is significantly more improved, and there's a little bit less feeling of randomness as far as who gets benefits of cards based on the cycle of revealing cards and predicting each other's counts. So two players is my preferred player count. I still enjoy it at three. I will still happily play it at three. It gives you a fun resource conversion puzzle in a very accessible time frame, even at three players, but two players is absolutely my preferred player count for Glass Road. As far as what I like, don't like, and can see others not liking, the first thing is going to be that time frame and crunchiness uh, factor over here. Glass Road, to me, is one of the crunchiest and enjoyable games i I can get in a 30 to 45 minute experience. It gives me a solid game that feels like a full Uwe Rosenberg, you know, you know, resource conversion, turn this into that, puzzle out your optimal pathway forward, and it does so in a time frame that is usually unlike this style of game from Uwe Rosenberg. And so the the amount you that he crams into a very short time frame is off the bat one of the reasons I like Glass Road. But additionally, I very much enjoy that that aspect of card play in this game for a variety of reasons. First of all, it's different than many of the things he has, and so I enjoy that uniqueness in terms of the way you're trying to play cards to get the resources you need. But additionally, the whole mind game you have 
I enjoy the mind game to begin with. The mind game of, okay, I think you're going to be trying to add pawns to your board because you're clearly going with a pawn strategy. So I'm going to play my pawn builder so I can follow you and also cripple you at the same time. That entire mind game is enjoyable to begin with, but an additional side benefit that I particularly enjoy about it is the fact that because you never have a guarantee of what you'll get, because you're always planning for getting as much as possible while understanding that your actions can be compromised, I find that to a certain extent it removes a factor that is often prevalent in this style of gameplay, which is min-maxing your way to the perfect action. You can't. You can't min-max your way. You can't sit there and say, well, I'm going to get three clay, I'm going to spend two clay here, I'm going to get four water, I'm going to turn the water. You can't do that because you don't know what you're going to get. You're trying to, assert, to a certain extent, get what you're going to get, but you can't perfectly predict it, and you know, statistically speaking, you're going to be wrong at least once or twice, and so you kind of have to go for a general picture of what you're trying to do, making sure you have enough resources to kind of have backup plans, but at a certain point, you can't min-max your way to perfection. You have to just kind of accept it and move on and start executing on your turn, and you'll use whatever extra stuff you got next turn. I like the game. I like the way the game forces you to do that. I like the way the game forces you to be adaptable as you plan your strategy, but accept the fact that it will not be a perfect strategy. I also like the clever use of these dials. I mean, it doesn't really improve the gameplay, honestly, but it is a clever use of the way these dials rotate. It's just a fun little system that I haven't seen done a lot. I believe he's done it in Or Labor as well, if I'm not mistaken. It's been a while since I played Or Labor. But I, I generally appreciate that. Uh, but then lastly, I just find that watching the buildings grow and shrink and adding buildings to your board and having a ton of abilities on these buildings. You have giant piles of buildings. I didn't even put them all out over here. You have a ton of buildings in the game, buildings you can cycle through and give you all the small variations of the same concepts, but they give you enough variation as far as what you're trying to do, like get points for the forest in your board, get points for empty territories, get points for being next to ponds, turn this into that, turn that into this, remove a tile from your board to get this. A ton of abilities on those tiles and watching your own personal landscape grow and shrink and adding pawns so you can get this removing forest so you can have more space for that adding buildings so you can ultimately get points the entire process is incredibly rewarding for what it's doing as far as what i don't like like i said already the three-player game feels a drop unfair and based on the way the cars come out i'm not as much of a fan of the three-player game i still like it still enjoy it but it's certainly a big step down for me as far as my personal enjoyment of the game and then sometimes the game can feel a bit too short I, I just told you how much I like the game because of how short it is, and that's definitely true, but there are times where I'm kind of like, I just feel like I'm just getting my resource conversion up and running, and maybe a fifth round would be fun, but, you know, I, I just keep playing it the way it is because it's not that big a complaint, and really the point is I far more prefer it for the time slot it's in, even though I kind of want to get a bit more stuff done, but at that point I should just be playing a different Uwe Rosenberg game instead. As far as I can see, others not liking a few more things there. First of all, the card play can feel a bit random, both in the way it comes out in terms of the gameplay or the, who chose what card in what order, but it can be hard to get a good feeling for how to play these cards, how to take advantage of these cards. Additionally, watching the buildings white beach round, I've seen players be frustrated by that because of the fact that you kind of have to plan for this round while accepting that your plans might fall through for this round. It does mean that you'll walk through rounds planning for building a certain building that is no longer there, that it wipes, that it clears, that it's absolutely gone, and you suddenly, yes, you know, you have your resources, you have your backup plans, but you couldn't get that one building that perfectly fits into your strategy, and that will happen. And it can be a bit frustrating because you, you, you're you always constantly operating in the moment in Glasswood. You're operating in the moment and you're accepting a degree of what will be will be which is not always what people are looking for. Sometimes they want that longer Euro game where it's like, it's less about when you get the building, but it's like, I'm working towards that building and I will get that building as I take this action, that action, and that action. And that doesn't really happen in Glass Road. You will either get the building or more buildings come out and you get another building as well. And secondly, or thirdly, I guess, your plans fall through all the time. That can be frustrating. It will regularly happen in this game where you play cards and you mess, you mess up others' cards and they mess up your cards and suddenly you're getting half the actions you did in an already short game. This kind of goes back to what I said earlier about having shorter games, which I find that the games that feel a bit shorter are usually the ones in which your actions on both sides were compromised far more often. So sure, it's fair because you both got compromised or it's fair because of strategy and all that stuff, but it still feels like sometimes you get less done if you played less efficiently. And so that can be a factor, just watching your plans fall through watching yourself get less done and then lastly i will say it's worth noting that while i personally find that for myself and most of my player group i find that the lack of perfect information actually accelerates the game and makes it work faster because you cannot plan around perfection depending on the mindset you are i've certainly played against others who found themselves crippled by that aspect because suddenly there's two ways to look at it way one is that you don't have perfect information and you have to accept a degree of unknown and so you instead compromise and plan in generalities accepting that you will not get everything you want. 
Way two is you sit there and try to plan through every variation of every backup plan so that you don't just have one perfect plan, rather you have 17 variations of different perfect plans depending on which of your cards are compromised. If you fall into that camp, if you need that degree of perfection, if you're not willing to let the obfuscation of information prevent you from that perfection, then you will actually take far longer in Glass Road. It has not happened to me a lot, but I have been in games with people who fell into that camp, and I will not play this game with them again. It is just way... The entire point of this game is the faster degree of playing it, and not the fact that you will take so long to play your turn because you're planning through a million different possible scenarios. As far as final thoughts on Glass Road, I mean, it should be clear from the very get-go of this video. I like this game. I'm a fan of this game. I've been a fan of, of Glass Road since, I mean, when I first got into the hobby, one of the things I did shortly on my way in was start diving into Uwe Rosenberg games. Agricola, Feast for Liang, uh, Lahav, a whole bunch of games, diving into every single one I could get my hands on and enjoying all of them. And they've, they've come and gone over the years. Some are still here, some have gone. I've enjoyed all of them, but there's only so many ways I can convert resources before I sit there and say I want these four as opposed to these 50. And Glass Road has always been one of the better ones for me because it feels different than those other games because it gives me the crunchiness of an UA game because it does so in 30 to 45 minutes generally depending on who you're playing with because it does so in a way that gives you that lack of perfect information making it more accessible although arguably less accessible depending on who you are but I really enjoy Glass Road I really enjoy the puzzles providing I really enjoy the the sheer the, the space it fits in the space it lacks some of the overarching amazement that you'll get out of a game like Lahav or Feast for Odin because it's doing so much and so little but at the same time that ratio is just so ridiculously good that I really strongly recommend Glass Road. This one's a 4 to 5 for me. It's a really solid game, really accessible, really easy to dive into, accessible in terms of uh, resource conversion games. I really enjoy this one quite a bit. As far as other game recommendations, I have two. First of all, if you're looking for another strongly based resource conversion game that plays in a short time frame, the recent Furnace from uh, Arcane Wonders is a fantastic game that has uh, joined Glass Road as far as games that I want a crunchy degree of crunchiness, but in a shorter time frame. And then if you want to level it up a bit, if you want my personal favorite Uwe Rosenberg, Uwe Rosenberg game, uh, La Havre is going to be a fantastic experience that is significantly longer than Glass Road, but gives you a significantly more in-depth experience at the same time. Until next time, I'm Alex Radcliffe from Board Game Co. I hope you found this review helpful, and as always, have a good one.